Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, so I, um, I want to carry on this week a little bit to chew on some of the things we started last week. I want to talk about straight lines in a crooked world again because I'm not finished pushing this through my own spirit and sharing what I, uh, what I want to share with you. Remember, we, uh, we use the verse from the Bible or two verses from the Bible from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 that talk about something called the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, that's love and joy and peace and long-suffering, which we put patience in brackets because one version of the Bible uses the word patience, but patience is not just long-suffering. Patience is like, well, I'll wait for five minutes. Long-suffering is, I'll wait for as long as it takes. I'll stay for as long as is necessary. And kindness, there's not enough kindness in our world. Seriously. Kindness is not what you do to return to somebody what they did for you. That's retribution, that's not kindness, that's retribution. And Jesus said, what good is it if you do good to those who did good to you? You know, even, even kind of wild heathen people do that. Goodness is when you operate from a spirit of kindness to other people, whether or not that situation deserves it, and you bring goodness into it. We were raised with the verse in... in uh, in our old Sunday school days, don't render evil for evil, but rather do good to all men. That's goodness. A faithfulness, that's also an amazing. Faithfulness is not you sticking around while it suits or you're getting what you want. Faithfulness is sticking around when you're not getting what you want and it doesn't suit. But faithfulness, all these things have a reward. Gentleness is another one and self-control. And it says, against such there is no law. There is no law in the universe that can stop you moving into a place of blessing and prosperity when you will put these straight lines into a crooked world. Now, I wanted to subtitle the, uh, the message tonight of straight lines in a crooked world because I want to talk to you a little about, about something that, that is from a Greek word. The Greek word that is used is the Greek word sarx, S-A-R-X, which the English translation is flesh. But the translation of that word is not, is not just um, like your body, your physical body. It actually means more of that. It means, it means the very essence of who you are as a human being is what the Bible means when it uses the word flesh. Now, for those of you who read the Bible, the, the New International Version is a disaster because it translates flesh as sinful nature. And flesh is not sinful nature. Flesh is the you, Okay? Now it can become sinful, but flesh is the you, and it's all right to be flesh. You were made human, okay? As the song goes, we're only human after all, okay? Um, and so, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about like that in the, in tonight in the context of straight lines in a, in a crooked world. So, so I subtitled it by something that, 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 um, that relates to that word, and, and it also connects to an old... Um, an old song by Errol Brown, Hot Chocolate. And uh, my wife always thought <laughs> that Errol Brown was singing, I believe in miracles, praise the Lord, you sexy thing. <laughs> Liz hey, hey, listen to it, and I guarantee you next time you hear it, he is definitely singing, praise the Lord, you sexy thing. So I, uh, I thought my subtitle tonight would be, I believe in miracles, praise the Lord, you sexy thing. Because although we are flesh, I want to bring you to a place where you will praise the Lord, you sexy thing, because you realize that there is a solution to crooked, crooked, straight, for straight lines in a, in a crooked world. Now... Just to run back a little bit to last week, I showed you a, a little image on the screen, which is the dots. 
which if you remember, some of you weren't here, what do you see on the screen? I remember you see a circle of dots going round inside another circle, a wheel. The truth is that's not happening at all. You think it's happening, but my illustration was that things are not always what you think they are, and the interpretation is not always what you think you see. And so if you weren't here last week, and for those who were, you can do it again. Just pick any one dot and watch what the dot is doing. Okay? And then pick any other dot, change dot, and watch what that dot is doing. How many of you can see that actually it's not a circle of dots going round inside another circle? It's a series of dots that are going from extreme to extreme in a straight line. They are straight lines in a crooked world. But we get caught up in the motion and we don't realize what is going on. But something straight in the crooked is taking place that actually is the truth within the movement that you think you see and it's the truth for your life. Now, another thing I need to just introduce into this is, is, um, is the whole issue of time. It's interesting that in the Hebrew mind from where the Bible was written, they didn't see time the same way that we see time. In the Western mind, we perceive time to be a straight line, linear. You have a start and you have an end. You, you're born here and you die here. But the Hebrews never saw that as being time, and so they didn't write from that perspective, which is why some concepts about eternity would be alien to the very people who wrote the Bible, okay? Because what they saw was time was cyclical. Time went like that. And of you know, before the advent of digital clocks, we had proper clocks and proper watches. And what happens in a clock and a watch? It doesn't go in a straight line. The time does what time always did do, and that I believe is the eternal truth about time. It was cyclical. So it was no beginning and no ending, but it went around and around. Now, I happen to believe that time works like that, and I think eternity is another cycle like that, right next to time, and the two are very close. And the whole object of God in Christ revealing himself was that his word who was in heaven can become flesh in the earth, or in other words, those two worlds collide, which is why Jesus said, I want you to pray, your kingdom come, and your will be done here on earth like it is in heaven. So two, two systems operating side by side, but this wonderful thing called the kingdom of God uh, colliding with our lives, which brings something of the the supernatural. So, so time is like a wheel. We'll say a little bit more about that. I'm not going to express any more about that at this moment. Um, what I do want to talk about there is, is the spirit dimension of life. Um, it's very easy in the busyness of life and in the technological age where our scientific discoveries are immense, and they are some just incredible things. Microbiology and all of these things are fantastic. And, uh, you know, the, the nuclear science is just unbelievably amazing. Um, but in all that, you can lose sight of the fact that there is a dimension that is spirit. And there is a part of you that is spirit and that it's not enough just to approach life from a flesh perspective. You have to have a spirit dimension. That's why it's foolish to rule God out of the equation of life. A guy wrote in the Psalms, the fool says in his heart there is no God. Now, he wasn't being ultra defensive of his belief system and trying to curse people. He was saying it's really not wise... To, to exclude God from the equation of your thinking and exercise yourself to understand what that means because there is a part of you that critically needs its connection with God the Father. And, um, you know, I've, I've given you some stories over the time. I, you know, I, I have many things that, that show that spirit realm. One of the most simple illustrations I've ever used about spirit is the one, how many of you ever walked into a room... And you just know, don't you? You just know that those two smiling people who've just greeted you and said, we're so glad you came, have been rowing. I mean, they have been going at it hammer and tongue. And they're smiling and they've shake your hand and they've given you a drink, but you just know you could, what's the phrase we use? I could have cut the atmosphere 
with a knife. What do you mean? Can you literally get a knife and cut the atmosphere? No. What you mean is that there was something that is not physical, but that was real in the situation. Now, that, that's the dimension that is called spirit. I, I've told you before, I remember, I remember as I sat beside my, my father's bed when he was in the hospice um, a few days before he died. It was a Saturday evening. I was getting ready to come here from the, the hospice and I just became very aware. I couldn't see it with my natural eyes, but you know I could see it. You know, like in a dream, you see things that are so vivid and so real. And I don't know if you're a daydreamer. I'm a daydreamer. You know, and you see things so real. And as I was there, I was conscious two, two guys had walked into the room and stood at the end of my father's bed, one on each corner of the bed, standing like this, just looking forward at my father. Now, my, my perception was that they were angelic, okay? That was my perception, just from the way that they were. And uh, um, I couldn't see them physically, but um, uh, this, this is... Now, my father at that time was in a coma. He was in and out of, of coma. He was, he was on the morphine and in and out, and uh, I left, and the next day I came back on the Sunday, and my father was lucid, he, he, he was, and the first thing he said to me, he said, hey lad, he said, um, he said, it was funny, funny thing happened yesterday, he said, I think it was yesterday, but I don't know, he said, but these two fellas, he said, they came in, and they came to the end of the bed, and they stood at the end of the bed, one on each corner, this, this, is, this was the day that I was there when he was in the coma. And he said, it was wonderful. He said, but I thought they'd come to take me. He was very peaceful. He wasn't afraid of dying. He was very peaceful and, and confident in his faith. He said, I, th I thought they'd come to take me. He said, but then, but then they, uh, they left. And uh, these were the same, the thing that I had seen that I hadn't told him. I hadn't prompted him. I hadn't said, oh, dad, you know, did you see anything? He came straight out with this the next time that I saw him, this, this is a dimension of spirit which absolutely exists, which you do not need to be afraid of, although there are some things within the dimension of spirit that can be scary, but, but we belong to somebody who's taken care of all that in Jesus, so you don't need to be afraid. It was also interesting this week, I, um, I had a guy contact me in April um, on Twitter, who I have not seen in... Uh, 20 some years and um, uh, he contacted me on Facebook and uh, he was asking me about myself and telling me about him wanting to, to make contact. Now what is interesting is that about 28 years ago um, when I was going in and out of a place called Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, because there's a story attached to that which is also very connected spiritually, I had this incredible sense, you know, where I was, we called it a burden, I had a burden had this incredible sense um, that there was destiny that I needed to connect with in Boulder, Colorado. Now, I was going to Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, out of Denver, and pretty much have to pass Boulder, but I just felt this tremendous sense that there was destiny in Boulder. So I, I went a couple of times into Boulder, and while I was there, God really spoke to me very clearly. And uh, I didn't know why I was there, but... but um, by, by a series of things that just came to me, I, I finished up really having this sense that I was supposed to see somebody at, at City on the Hill. This was where it was, City on a Hill. Now, I didn't know at that time, but there was a church in Boulder called City on a Hill. And uh, I finished up um, looking that up and then connecting with a guy called Lauren Ancarlo. And uh, when I went to see Lauren Ancarlo, I... I had something in my heart, in my spirit, that God had given me that I felt I needed to tell him. So I got an appointment with him very graciously, went to see Lauren and Carlo at City on the Hill, and I shared this word with him, which was quite a word about his future and some decisions that, that needed to be made, and I left, and then and that was it. I didn't go back. I, I thought, well, that's really strange, and you know, I really felt there was something more than just giving a word to this guy. So anyway... Uh, uh, several years later, which is now about, I'm guessing, um, I'm guessing it's going to be about 13, 40, no, 
11, 12 years ago, 12 years ago, I'm trying to locate it on different things. 12 years ago, I, I'm invited to speak in, in a church in Panama City, Florida, with a, a guy called Apostle Nolan Ball. And as I get up to speak in Nolan's church in, in, in Panama City, Florida, um, I suddenly see this guy and this girl sat down here about where Jenny is. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to speak, and, and I can't all the time. I'm, so I stopped and I said, look, I said, I, I really apologize. I said, but I, I can't stop looking at you. And I said, every time that I look at you, all I can think of is Boulder, Colorado, and a guy called Lauren Ann Carlo, who I spoke to many, many years ago. He grinned, you know, and... And it's like, well, okay. Carried on. He came straight to me after the service. He said, he said uh, in three weeks' time, myself and my wife are relocating to Boulder, Colorado from Panama City because we feel that God spoke to us about starting a church there. Now, they've done that and started the church. Incidentally, Lauren and Carlo, who I gave the word to, which was quite an instructive word about some things that were going on, is in prison. Now, I don't say that with any delight, but I kind of wish you'd listened, and sometimes I wish some of you would listen when you're told stuff that doesn't look like it's anything at the time, but actually, it's prophetic. Lauren Ancarlo is in prison. He was a naughty boy. And, um, and, but what's interesting is, we've now got the thing going on in Salt Lake, which is just across the mountains, and uh, all of a sudden, this guy, Eric Hardy, is now back in contact from a word that was 12 years ago that went all the way back to 28 years ago that there is a dimension called spirit that is at work for every one of us and in every one of us and God in Jesus wants you to connect with this supernatural dimension of the spirit. So, when we deny the reality of spirit as a dimension of life, we diminish truth and we rob ourselves of vital ingredient in the quest for wholeness and fulfillment. You're not going to get whole, you're not going to be fulfilled unless you pay attention to your spirit. See, spirit and flesh are actually not separate. That's a Greek idea. Spirit and flesh are not separate. They are two entities on opposite ends of a spectrum. So if you can imagine, I'm human, and so I'm here... And the stuff that goes on, how many of you know we feel stuff, we desire stuff, we want stuff, stuff moves us. And the spirit over here, which I am also, and these two are not meant to be separate, but they are totally opposite to each other. And there's a bit of a fight goes on inside of us about we have, which we have to make a choice. Now, uh, in case you think flesh, for some of you churchy people... In case every time you think flesh, you think kind of wickedness, sinfulness, uh, you know, anything that's flesh is wrong, let me give you three scriptures to blow that out of the water. John 1.14, and the word became flesh. So if flesh means sin, when God in Jesus became, when God became Jesus, that the living person, he became flesh. So therefore, it cannot mean that anything to do with flesh is automatically therefore wrong or sinful because he became flesh and dwelt among us. John 3, 6 says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. But the two are two entities, but not separate entities. They are two entities that you have to learn to make those work together. Just like the spirit in Jesus, who was human flesh, had to come together, but in it, it brought wholeness and fulfillment and healing. Let me give you one more. John 6 verse 51 says, uh, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. My point is, flesh in itself is not sinful, wrong, depraved, to be despised. It's, it's who you are as much as spirit. The problem is, we start to get so caught up in a flesh world that then we lose sight of the spirit, and when we lose sight of the spirit and the flesh world takes over, it produces certain things, which I'm going to explain to you in just a moment. Now, each of these things, flesh and spirit, my, my natural living physical self and the spirit, that thing inside of me 
that is connected with, if you like, another world, another dimension. Each want different things. And I could show you that as we look at Galatians 5 and other scriptures, but we're not going to take the time to do that. To suppress either fully... Now, I didn't say there are some things of the flesh that need to be suppressed. I would also say there are some things of the spirit that need to be suppressed because the number of people who excuse choices by saying, the Lord told me, when I'm like, yeah, and pigs might fly, and I'm sorry if you think that's critical, but I've, I've been around too long for it to impress me. That can be used just as much, right, as the other part of it. Uh, each want different things. To suppress either is fully is to deny our humanity and also to deny that humanity the possibility of becoming complete. Don't deny your humanity the possibility of becoming complete by rejecting the need for your spirit to have a right connection with where it came from and who feeds it, okay? Now, what's interesting is in the biblical account of creation, when, when the Bible talks about giving us a model for how God made man. It says God, God formed him from the dust of the earth and he breathed into him the breath of life. Now, that word breath, uh, the breath of life, is the Hebrew word that is spirit. It's the Hebrew word ruach. So into the clay that became flesh, this, God breathed ruach, spirit. The breath of God was spirit. So right from the beginning, what produced life was flesh and spirit working together in the way that they were designed and made. See, flesh and spirit are to be brought together in Christ, not separated from each other. And the gospel is this, that God wants to bring your flesh and your spirit together in Christ so that in that place there is wholeness and completeness. The wholeness you're looking for, the completeness you will never find outside of your spirit coming alive to God in Christ. But when those two things happen and the flesh and the spirit come together, you become the man and the woman that God always designed for you to be. However, it's also worth noting what flesh on its own will do. And I think this is important. So I'm going to read you some verses from the message version of the Bible. And please pray for Eugene Peterson at the moment, who did an awesome job doing his paraphrased translation of the Message Bible from Street Greek into English because he happened to say that at this point in his life, in his 70s, he, he cannot find a reason to object to gay marriage. Now, whatever your views are on that, it, that's not the issue. The issue is over that one statement, people are now talking about taking all message out of, the, out of Bible bookshops, Christian bookshops, about basically blackballing Peterson because he made one comment about one thing that in essence some of it is, you know, there, there are questionable things in the whole subject matter. And I think that's sad. So please pray for Eugene Peterson because I think he really is a man of God and he's a lovely man and he shouldn't be getting all that flack. And it's all right for people to disagree. That's not my issue. But it's not all right not to be kind and, and to show goodness and to show self-control to show faithfulness. All right, leave that aside. All right, you've grinded your axe. Shut up. Okay. Okay. So it's worth noting what flesh on its own will do. And, and this is what, how Peterson translated Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Just listen to this, because I think it's so clear. It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Now you say, I'm not trying to get my own way. The whole point of flesh is, if we're honest, we're always in it for us. It's a, it's a selfishness that's like, we, we might mask it and we might have false humility, but at the end of the day, our flesh tends to be self-protecting and self-promoting because we're looking after number one, okay? That's called flesh, okay? So it's obvious what kind of life develops out of this flesh life all the time. Repetitive, repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. Uh, that's, 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 uh, it's a bit like describing Love Island. <laughs> I 
There's not much love, it is on an island, but there's plenty of cheap sex. And this is what he's describing. You will not find that wholeness in that environment. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. So that's one of the things that flesh will do, okay? A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. That's another thing that flesh will do to you. You will gather up a stinking accumulation of, of mental and emotional garbage. How many of you know that's true? And it's the flesh that does that, okay? It gathers it. Um, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. <laughs> These are great descriptions that Peterson's put in here. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. All that stuff of you're just going to go at it really hard, because if I go after this really hard, it's bound to make me happy. And then you realize, actually, it hasn't. You know, it's just left me empty, lonely, sometimes with a headache or whatever. But frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. These are all what, what flesh does. I like this one as well. Trinket gods. Right? That means finding, God, be, being kind of spiritual but not in the sense that, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of into God, but, but trinket gods. Kind of pick a god, any god, who cares which god it is, just pick the god that suits you. And if you need to make him like you need him to be and worship that trinket god. And that's all it is, a trinket god. It's a self-created idol trinket god. Now I love this. Magic show religion is another thing of the flesh. Now I like the fact that he's saying flesh doesn't just work outside church, flesh also works inside church. Flesh doesn't just work in non-religious environments, flesh works just as much in religious environments, and Peterson's making a note of that, that in a religious mindset, we can be guilty of magic show religion. Listen to this paranoid loneliness. Now, it's one thing to be lonely, but when you're also paranoid about being lonely, it's even worse. But how many people think, I'm afraid I'll be left alone? Hey, I'm afraid I'll be left alone. Or we can't be secure in relationships and friendships. And the whole thing of you walk down the street, you think everybody's looking at you and thinking horrible things about you. Cutthroat competition. That again is something that turns up in the most subtle of ways but actually, at the end of the day, it's cutthroat competition. I have to be seen as better than you. You have to be seen as less than me, worse than me. Because my whole identity is based on who you think I am, not on who I know I am. That's what cutthroat competition does. My identity based on who you think I am. So then you're always doing things to get other people to think things about you, which what they think won't be real because you never settle to who you really are. You've entered cutthroat competition because you need people to see you in a certain way. An impotence to love or be loved. Let me tell you what. If, if we don't get this right, what happens is even our deepest desire, which is to be loved and to love, we become impotent in that area. We cannot find love and we cannot give love because we're always afraid the love that we give won't be received or we give stuff like sex thinking that that's giving love, because if I don't do this, how's that person going to respond to me? So we finish up doing things because we become impotent to love or to be loved, and then we can't recognize genuine love, and we don't know how to respond to genuine love. These are all what happens when we're in the flesh. Divided homes. Have we not got that one up there? Is it not on, Robert? Okay. Okay. Well, he's gone ahead. Oh, have I missed some out? Why did I miss out? Oh, yeah, we're coming back to that then. Okay, that's right. 
Oh, I did miss some out. Go back, Robert. My fault. Sorry. It's a bit small here. Cutthroat competition, all-consuming, yet never satisfied once. Wow. All-consuming, but yet never satisfied once. All this stuff going on inside that consumes you about what you want, but you're actually never satisfied... Even when you get what you want, because your reason for wanting what you got is not based in anything in your spirit. It's only based because you think somehow if I get stuff, this thing, this flesh, this me is going to feel really good. Well, it never does. It, you're right. Thank you, Georgia. Love your heart. A brutal temper. The thing that some of you put away when you're in church. I think nobody knows. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a leader, I'm a pastor. I've had to deal with many situations where brutal temper has been the problem and you'd never know it. For some of you, your reaction, even if it doesn't come out, in a violent way, is a brutal temper. What you think, what you send towards somebody, what you, what you are projecting in your spirit. A brutal temper is part of that flesh thing. Boy, this is happy stuff, isn't it? Um, yeah, an impotence to love or be loved, we've done that. Divided homes and divided lives. These are all what come from flesh alone, right? Right? When we don't acknowledge and appreciate, there has to be a reconnection with spirit through God in Jesus that brings the spirit alive and brings the kingdom of God to touch our natural world so that we have wholeness and peace and satisfaction. Okay? Divided homes and divided, divided lives, an interesting comment. The fact that we actually can be against our own selves. That we do stuff and then what we think of ourselves, that's called a divided life. Can't come to peace with yourself about yourself. You know, most suicides are not the result of a divided home, they're a result of a divided life. Cannot come to peace with yourself about where you've been, what you've done, what has happened, what hasn't been done, and suddenly your divided life brings you to a place where the flesh begins to do what the flesh will always do. Okay, let's get through this. Small-minded and lopsided pursuits. In other words, we can all get a bit stupid when we function only by the flesh, and so our pursuits are lopsided, which means there's no balance. It's not going to bring us where we want. And verse 21, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Well, I can act this way, I can feel this way, I can think this way, because everybody's a rival, everybody's against me, nobody understands me, so I'll depersonalize them into a rival. Listen, they've got a story just like you've got a story. Oh, and then he goes on to say, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. This is where flesh leads, right? It's where flesh leads. And then ugly parodies of community. In other words, things that look like community, but they're not really community. Because in ugly parodies of community, what unites the community is never anything that's of spirit. It's only ever of flesh. And the most common ugly parody of community is uniting over a common offense. We're up by the same thing. We feel the same feeling. We're upset at the same person. And we have an ugly parody of community. It's not community because that person who's joined with you in your offense, just bear in mind, when you offend them, will do the same to you. Come on, get, get wise, get bright. Okay? Need some goodness and some kindness. And I like this, he says, I could go on but I won't. And he says, this isn't the first time I warned you. You know if you use your freedom in this way, because you are free, but if you only use your freedom to think that you can meet all the needs by just feeding your flesh, your person being, your ambitions, your desires, your wants, he said, if you just think you can do it that way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I don't think 
personally this has got anything to do with going to heaven and not going to heaven. Because inheritance is something that you have. And inheritance is something that comes from... There is an inheritance God has given by His Spirit that we become participants of that you cannot inherit that while you live in the flesh. And that's where the problem is for, shall I say, some of us, not some of you. For probably all of us in some way. And we need salvation. But the nice thing is, he goes on to say in verse 22, but... I like when there's a but, okay? That's where flesh will take you if you don't understand that there is a dimension called spirit and that God sent Jesus to bring your spirit alive so he could unite your spirit and flesh back together so that you could have wholeness and completeness because of that unifying of spirit and flesh. But, and he goes on to the the one I've been wrestling with, but the fruit of the spirit which is actually God's spirit in your spirit, causing your spirit to be fruitful. But the fruit of the spirit is, and I'm going to put a phrase in here as we kind of come to where we're finishing. The fruit of the spirit is like the spokes in the wheel of time. Let me explain that as I give you a little image to close with. The fruit of the spirit is like the spokes in the wheel of time. Here is time, all of time, our time. But there are spokes in the wheel of time. I believe that these things called the fruit of the Spirit, these straight lines that we illustrated in our first diagram, are the fruit of the Spirit that flow from eternity to eternity. They flow from the farthest way out you can go that way to the farthest way you can go that way. And if you allow those to flow all the way through life, what you have is eternity touching your life as you live in that line, as you live on that line and through that line by the Spirit. It's like the spokes in the wheel of time. And so I had Danny make me a little spokes in the wheel of time. Now, um, it's not Danny's fault. He looks a bit like gay pride. (laughs) And I don't mind that it does. But we wanted to do some color so that you could actually see. If you imagine that's the wheel of time, but across the wheel of time, in straight lines, not crooked lines, and the reason I talk about straight lines is because for many of us, love has become a crooked line. Self-control has become a crooked line. Faithfulness has become a crooked line. But when we live that by the Spirit, that line straightens out, and we experience love and we give love in a straight line that goes from eternity to eternity, that has something flowing through it that is not manufactured by your effort or by your flesh just like the love of God is not manufactured by effort or by flesh it flows from him in a straight line and all of these things we could repeat that but I'm not going to repeat it for every one of us okay from everlasting to everlasting one guy wrote in the bible The Lord's love is with those that fear him. From as far out as you can go. So this thing is a spirit thing. It flows through time from eternity. From a dimension beyond us that God wants these things to touch your life first. To be part of your life. And then to be the manifestation of your life. Rather than all those things that we described in flesh. Because when you live here, what you show is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Of which he wrote against such there is no law. There's no law of the universe that can stand in the way of your wholeness and completeness. And your connection with God the Father when these things become part of your life. So, I want to give you one last thought. And the thought is about how spokes work. How many of you have seen a bike with spokes in? How many of you know how spokes work? Listen to this. I love this. This this is just awesome. How spokes work. How do spokes accomplish their terrific and heroic feat? So, here's our wheel. Here's the wheel of time moving along. How do these spokes accomplish their terrific and heroic feats? You have to know it's, it's a bit of a bike anorak guy when he talks about spokes accomplishing terrific and heroic feats. And I got this off a bike site where, you know, 
Can you imagine? Let me tell you about the spokes of a bike and their terrific and heroic feats. It's like, they're just spokes on a bike. But I get excited about this, like this guy was getting excited about the spokes in his wheel. First, spokes don't push outwards holding the rim at bay, like it might seem. So spokes are not pushing outwards holding the rim together, okay? Rather, the rim is evenly pulled inward by the spokes. The spokes on a bike wheel are not keeping the wheel out, they're pulling the wheel in. These spokes on this wheel are not pushing out, they're pulling in. When you walk into this dimension, these things pull the kingdom of God into your life. They are pulling it in all the time. They pull on the kingdom. The whole circle of eternity that is God's kingdom is being pulled in by the spokes, just like the spokes on a wheel. It's pulling the rim in. It's pulling the kingdom into you. Where the flesh is pushing out, the spirit is pulling it all in so that it can become one for us. I love that. Spokes don't push outward, holding the rim at bay like it might seem. Rather, the rim is evenly pulled inward by the spokes, which are laced through the hub, the center part of the wheel that rotates around the axle. Tension between the hub and rim is applied evenly in all directions, making the assembly extraordinarily strong and also somewhat flexible and resistant to shock. So as these spokes pull in, here's what it does. Remember all those things we said the flesh does? This is what the Spirit does, okay? But the fruit of the Spirit, this is what the Spirit does. This is what the Spirit looks like as it pulls the kingdom in and makes that tension. It makes the assembly, which is your life in here, extraordinarily strong and also somewhat flexible and resistant to shock. That's how life is supposed to be. This uniformly applied tension is what supports your weight on the wheels. The fruit of the Spirit is the uniformly applied tension in the context of a human life that makes you complete and gives you the support to allow the wheel of your life to go through life showing the kingdom of God in his grace, his peace, his love, his life, his salvation, his restoration for you. But the fruit of the Spirit is. So here's the question. Are you going to keep living in the flesh? Or can I say to you tonight, I believe in miracles. Praise the Lord, you sarksy thing, because, because you have understood there needs to be this tension and you're saying, God, I really want your spirit to touch my spirit. So that as the wheel of time is going and eternity is there, that there is a tension pulling eternity into my life, pulling the kingdom of God into my life in joy and peace and patience and love and self-control and faithfulness and gentleness and goodness and, and kindness. And as we begin to experience those in our own life because that's God's kingdom pressing into us and God is all of those things to you. He is full of joy over you incidentally. He actually likes you. As we pull those things in, those things then start to become the, the manifestation of our life. So we actually can live life in the flesh. We can do things that only flesh can do, which God made us to do. But we do them in the right order. We do them under the right premise. We do them with the connection of spirit. So that as we live, our whole life is redeemed. Bought back. Made one. And I believe that's what the gospel of Jesus is all about. The word became flesh, but his body then was touched by spirit, so then we have life. And I believe that life can be a reality in every person. I don't believe God waits to say, you can have this. I think God says, this is here, will you step into it? I've often said I used to preach the gospel and say, now will you like to invite Jesus into your life? Now I preach the gospel and say, you know, Jesus wants to invite you into his life. And this is his life. 
And it's pulling kingdom in all the time. So on you bow your heads with me just for one moment. Just have a quick prayer. And then we're done. If, if there's anybody here tonight, just, just as we go and pray, because I, I wouldn't want to miss this opportunity. I'm going to sing out with you uh, and do the offering. But if there's anybody here tonight that, that this idea of, of, you know, Jesus invites you into his life. He invites you into his life, the life that is him, that, that he brings from the Father, that was expressed in this incredible love at the cross. And he says, will, will you come into my life? Be part of, of my life so that my life can fill your life. If there's anybody tonight that, that just wants to say, yeah, I, I want to take that invitation, then just slip your hand up real quietly. I just want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else? We're just going to pray a very simple prayer in a moment. You want to say, yeah, I accept that invitation. I want to come into the life that he has brought for me and to me to know the fullness. All right, we're just going to pray right now. Those of you who raise your hand, just, just pray simply in your heart. Just, just, I come to you, Father, thanking you for your invitation for me to be part of your life, to come into your life. And I accept tonight, in Jesus' name, let there be a transformation and also let there be a confirmation in my life that you have work to work in me that is by the Spirit, that has switched something on that was switched off before. I receive that now by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, for every other heart, every other soul here, every other person, I pray the words that we've spoken will mean something to us and you'll help us to take what is important for our own life and make it a reality. But help us to live in the but of the fruit of the Spirit, where the spokes are pulling the kingdom into us and help us consistently and all the time to be people who live in the realm of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, because we believe that against such there is no law. Amen. All right, we're going to sing and the guy's going to receive the offering. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.